Okay, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me uh, clearly enough. Uh, welcome to this very exciting launch of the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool. I'm Hannah Vaughan-Jones uh, here for you in London. I know we have participants uh, and media and public joining from all over the world, so welcome to everybody. We are, of course, now several months into this global pandemic, and I think more than ever it's taught us, wherever we are in the world, of the need to work together and to support each other. And that's exactly what this initiative today is all about. I understand that so far we have some 35 countries and counting who have already uh, shown their support for this, this pool, this initiative. Um, as I said, we have a huge number of participants who will be taking part in the discussion over the course of the next hour and a warm welcome as well to all of the public and the media who will be joining as well I'm very interested no doubt in uh, in the uh, information and the discussion the debate uh, to come I also understand that we have received uh, already a supportive statement from the UN Deputy uh, Secretary General Amina Mohammed so that is fantastic as well now to formally uh, launch this uh, exciting initiative we do have I'm delighted to say His Excellency President Carlos Alvarado of Costa Rica and we also have the Honorable Mia Motley the Prime Minister of Barbados uh, on the line with us uh, live uh, but before we come to them uh, I would like to give the floor over to the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. President Alvarado, Prime Minister Motley, Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends. Since the beginning of the pandemic, science has been at the heart of WHO's efforts to suppress transmission and save lives. Science is moving with incredible speed. Almost every day there is more news about research into vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. But will all people benefit from these tools, or will they become another reason people are left behind? These are the two most important questions. A month ago, WHO and partners launched the SET or the ACT accelerator the speed up the development, production and equitable distribution of vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics for COVID-19. Today, we're joining 37 countries and numerous partners to launch the COVID-19 technology access pool or CTAP. CTAP was first proposed by His Excellency President Carlos Alvarado of Costa Rica, and I would like to thank His Excellency the President for his leadership and solidarity. CTAP is a sister initiative of the ACT Accelerator and offers concrete actions to achieve the objective of the ACT Accelerator, which is equitable access. CTAP has five priorities. First, public disclosure of gene sequencing research. Second, public disclosure of all clinical trial results. Third, encouraging governments and research funders to include clauses in contracts with pharmaceutical companies about equitable distribution and publication of trial data. Fourth, licensing treatments and vaccines to large and small producers. And fifth, promoting open innovation models and technology transfer that increase local manufacturing and supply capacity. Through CTAP, we're inviting companies or governments that develop an effective therapeutic to contribute the patent to the medicines patent pool, which would then sublicense the patent to generic manufacturers. CTAP is voluntary and builds on the success of the medicines patent pool in expanding access to treatments for HIV and hepatitis C. WHO recognizes the important role that patents play in fueling innovation. But this is a time when people must take priority. Tools to prevent, detect, and treat COVID-19 are global public, public goods that must be accessible 
by all people. Science is giving us solutions, but to make the solutions work for everyone, we need solidarity. COVID-19 has highlighted the inequalities of our world, but it's also offering us an opportunity to bring those inequalities and build a fairer world, a world in which health is not a privilege for the few, but a common good. Now, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce His Excellency Carlos Alvarado, the President of Costa Rica. Muchas gracias, Presidente Alvarado, mi hermano. Mucho gusto por su lider lider liderazgo. Thank you. Muchas gracias. I think it's mute, muted. Okay. Hannah, can you? Mi hermano, can you hear me? <laughs> Gracias, Dr. Tedros, mi hermano, my brother. Un saludo. Para Costa Rica es un honor ser parte de la acción colectiva que envía un mensaje potente a toda la humanidad sobre las cosas maravillosas que podemos y somos capaces de impulsar en conjunto para el resguardo y el bienestar de todas las personas. Hoy se trata de hacer un llamado a la esperanza, sobre todo para las personas más vulnerables en las distintas partes del mundo. Hoy, líderes estatales, altos representantes de organismos multilaterales, del sector privado, de la academia y de la sociedad civil, unimos voces para anunciar que hemos asumido un compromiso solidario con la vida, la dignidad humana y la cooperación internacional. La pandemia de COVID-19 marcará un antes y un después en la historia de la humanidad no solo por lo que ha significado para nuestros sistemas de salud y para la convivencia y relacionamiento entre personas, sino también porque, a pesar de la crisis que hemos tenido que enfrentar, tenemos la oportunidad de tomar decisiones conjuntas que cambien para bien el futuro de la población mundial en el corto y mediano plazo. Se presenta ante nosotros el desafío de toda una vida, garantizar el acceso universal a las tecnologías sanitarias que requerimos para hacer frente al COVID-19. La promesa de descubrimientos científicos seguros, efectivos y asequibles, como tratamientos y medicamentos, vacunas, debe ser el vehículo que oriente nuestras acciones y nos permita sobrellevar una crisis que ha dejado tanto dolor en tantas comunidades alrededor del orbe. Sin embargo, de nada nos sirve alcanzar estos increíbles desarrollos tecnológicos si no podemos garantizar el acceso asequible a las tecnologías. Al inicio de la pandemia, solicité al doctor general de la OMS, mi estimado amigo y hermano, el doctor Tedros Adano Gerbrayesus, que construyéramos juntos un mecanismo que nos permitiera poner a disposición de todos los estados del mundo las tecnologías en salud que se desarrollen en la lucha contra el virus y la enfermedad que ocasiona. Durante las últimas semanas, el esfuerzo conjunto nos ha permitido construir este llamado solidario de acción, mediante el cual tendremos una plataforma para compartir de manera abierta, voluntaria, y colaborativa el conocimiento, los datos y la propiedad intelectual que se genere alrededor del mundo, convirtiéndola en un bien público global, un bien público global. Durante la Asamblea Mundial de la Salud número 73, realizada de manera innovadora hace tan solo dos semanas, 
muchos estados miembros de la Organización Mundial de la Salud alzaron la voz y respaldaron el desarrollo de esta iniciativa, la cual permitirá que todos los países tengamos acceso a las soluciones que nos permitan protegernos entre todos, asegurándonos de no dejar a nadie atrás. En este camino se han sumado países de todas las regiones y rincones del mundo, a quienes les expreso mi más profundo agradecimiento, dado que han sobrepuesto el bienestar de su población por encima de cualquier otro fundamento. Mi profundo agradecimiento para Argentina, Bangladesh, Barbados, Bélgica, Belice, Bután, Brasil, Chile, Ecuador, Egipto, Honduras, Indonesia, Líbano, Luxemburgo, Malasia, Maldivas, México, Mongolia, Mozambique, Noruega, Oman, Países Bajos, Pakistán, Palau, Panamá, Perú, Portugal, República Dominicana, San Vicente y las Granadinas, Sudáfrica, Sri Lanka, Sudán, Timor del Este, Uruguay y Zimbabue. Aquellos jefes de Estado y jefes de gobierno que aún no se han sumado a este esfuerzo, los invito a no dejar pasar la oportunidad y ser parte de un hecho histórico para la humanidad. Les garantizo que nada será más reconfortante y gratificante que, dentro de unos años, cuando historiadores analicen este momento crucial, vean que todos nuestros países fueron parte de los actores internacionales que dieron un paso adelante y tomaron una decisión visionaria y más importante aún, profundamente humana. Como gobernantes debemos respaldar este llamado solidario, declarando nuestro apoyo al reservorio, en inglés llamado COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, CAP, de conocimientos de propiedad intelectual y datos. Debemos alentar a nuestras empresas públicas y privadas, así como a nuestras instituciones de investigación para que contribuyan de manera voluntaria a la plataforma de intercambio. Se nos han sumado igualmente actores del ámbito internacional que han dedicado su labor a la búsqueda del bienestar de las poblaciones que más sufren. Su vocación de servicio y proactividad merecen también mi reconocimiento. Igualmente al sector privado, se nos ha acercado con el afán de conocer la propuesta e identificar cómo pueden ser parte de ella. Celebro este paso al frente de quienes han entendido que solo en alianza desde lo público y lo privado podremos construir un futuro mejor. Un futuro donde todos los brillantes avances científicos de nuestras sociedades sean pilares en la construcción de un horizonte que dignifique cada vida. Un futuro donde nuestras capacidades sean potenciadas para seguir cimentando el camino del desarrollo sostenible. Para citar un ejemplo de buenas prácticas en Costa Rica, el sector privado también ha ofrecido su contribución. El compromiso de la industria es necesario para hacer eco a este llamado solidario. Boston Scientific, en conjunto con la Universidad de Minnesota, bajo el concepto de solidaridad y responsabilidad social corporativa, le ha brindado la preaprobación al gobierno utilizar de forma abierta el diseño del ventilador Coventor, con el fin de que este dispositivo médico pueda ser fabricado de manera local a través de las compañías que así lo deseen. La solidaridad dentro y entre los países y el sector privado es esencial si queremos superar estos tiempos difíciles. Necesitamos liberar todo el poder de la ciencia para ofrecer innovaciones que sean escalables, utilizables y que beneficien a todos en todas partes al mismo tiempo. Solo por medio de la aceleración de la investigación y del desarrollo de tecnologías sanitarias contra el COVID-19 es que podremos salir adelante. Sin embargo, ningún estado podrá haber superado la pandemia hasta que todos la hayamos superado, por lo que estos desarrollos deben ser asequibles para todos. Por eso invito a las industrias y sectores académicos, así como he invitado a la industria de la Academia Costarricense, a que registre y comparta su conocimiento, propiedad intelectual 
y datos de tecnologías sanitarias existentes y nuevas para combatir COVID-19 por el bien de toda la humanidad. La Universidad de Costa Rica ha desarrollado y pone a disposición de la humanidad un protocolo para la manufactura a partir del plasma de pacientes convalecientes de preparaciones inyectables de inmunoglobinas humanas hiperinmunes contra el SARS-CoV-2 para el tratamiento de pacientes en estado severo y crítico de la infección. También estas dos iniciativas relacionadas con el diseño y validación de isopos para las pruebas diagnósticas del COVID-19 y el desarrollo de los prototipos de respiradores para posteriormente trasladar el conocimiento al sector industrial. El Instituto Tecnológico de Costa Rica se hace presente en este repositorio y nos ha autorizado para que Costa Rica ponga a disposición internacional tres diferentes iniciativas que se trabajan para combatir el COVID-19. El desarrollo de mascarillas tipo N95, el diseño de cobertores para camillas de ambulancias para la Cruz Roja, el ventilador mecánico de accionamiento neumático. Por su parte, el Centro Nacional de Innovaciones Biotecnológicas, Cenebiot, pone a disposición de este repositorio un proyecto que consiste en optimizar protocolos escalables de detección de virus SARS-CoV-2 que prescinden del uso de kits comerciales y minimiza la dependencia de sistemas robóticos. El objetivo es crear alternativas en caso de escasez de kits y facilitar su implementación en regiones con acceso limitado a sistemas robóticos. La propuesta está inspirada en casos de éxito obtenidos en Uruguay, España y por el consorcio Crick COVID, pero se adaptó a la realidad regional y los resultados se pueden compartir libremente. Nuestra sociedad civil, siempre activa y pujante, es fundamental en el proceso, defendiendo la iniciativa y abogando para que más y más actores se integren de manera solidaria. Por ejemplo, su papel será importante para convencer a los titulares de los derechos de que se necesitan ser socios en esta iniciativa. El conocimiento compartido, la propiedad intelectual y los datos abiertos cristalizarán nuestros esfuerzos colectivos para avanzar en el descubrimiento científico, el desarrollo tecnológico y el amplio intercambio de los beneficios del avance científico y sus aplicaciones basadas en el desarrollo de la salud. Esta iniciativa establece un modelo viable para promover el acceso basado en la equidad, la ciencia sólida, la colaboración abierta y la solidaridad global. La solidaridad global acelerará la ciencia y ampliará el acceso a los bienes públicos globales para que sean juntos y así podamos vencer el virus. Cada compromiso, cada paso al frente cuenta. Nuestros pueblos nos observan y esperan liderazgos capaces de trabajar colectivamente por soluciones verdaderas, por acciones conjuntas, que nos permitan sin egoísmos reconstruir un mundo donde la salud pública universalmente resguardada sea un bien. Confío plenamente en el potencial humano, su capacidad de innovación y en su comprensión de que cada vida es una historia, son afectos, son ilusiones, y que vale el esfuerzo de trabajar sin descanso, de manera colaborativa, sin egoísmos, en multilateralismo, sector público, privado, academias, empresas, sociedad civil, para que pronto ninguna vida se apague a causa de esta pandemia. De corazón a todos los participantes de este foro, de este lanzamiento y de esta iniciativa, Muchas gracias, porque lo que queremos es apoyar a todas las personas de todo el planeta que hoy lo necesitan. Muchísimas gracias. Thanks uh, for that. I'm going to now give the floor over to the Honorable Mia Motley, the Prime Minister for Barbados. Um, Prime Minister Motley, I hope you're there and can hear us, and uh, you have the microphone. ¿Tienen la lista? 
Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much. Today, I join um, in solidarity with President of Costa Rica, my friend Carlos Alvarado Quesada, and my brother, Dr. Tedros Adhanman Gebrisas, the Director General of the WHO, and indeed my colleague heads of government, to add Barbados's strong support for this launch of this important platform. I also want at this stage to commend and to thank the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, my sister, Amina Mohammed, for her strong support at the outset of the launch of this platform. Like few other threats in our history, this pandemic shows up our common humanity in the most unequivocal of ways. Through our interconnectedness and our interdependence, the virus has reached all corners of our globe in a matter of months. It is almost like a horror story. Each of us has a story of human and economic loss. And what we write on history's page as our success story is yet to be determined. My friends, I tell you that it is our common humanity that brought us to this point, And it will only be through our common humanity that we will emerge from it. Now let us pause for a minute and think why. The reality is that democracy and multilateralism promised for both the countries and the world respectively that there would be a framework of fairness, transparency, and accountability for those who choose to agree to the compact that led to the democracy or led to the multilateralism. Regrettably, the last few months have brought us closest to the wild, wild west of fictitious fame. We have, in the small island developing states, stories enough to tell about lack of access to basic medical equipment, medical supplies, and we fear that when the therapeutics and the vaccines come, unless we assert the right of the multilateral institutions of our world to create that corridor of fairness, to reinforce the transparency and accountability that we need, then we are not going to fulfill the promise of the United Nations and the corresponding institutions that came out of the 1945 pact that allowed the world to have a new order. Access to new data and health products, therefore, to treat and prevent COVID-19 patients must not create winners and losers. And small states, who are often the casualties of market conditions, cannot be dispensable in the wake of this disease. I pause again to indicate that the consortium, the professional consortium being established by the Global Fund in order to procure many of the in vitro diagnostics cannot simply use a proxy of maternal mortality to be able to determine who should benefit. Because if they do, 13 countries in this part of the world, 10 from within the Caribbean, will be at a serious disadvantage. And we cannot command the types of orders because of our lack of size in order to be able to guarantee access. Barbados therefore calls on all stakeholders to make the tools of this recovery that the WHO and others are working on a global public good. I heard Dr. Tedros just now outline very clearly what we needed to hear as small island developing states. We therefore also encourage all flexibilities in the licensing of these products to quickly scale up global production. And we ask for full cooperation with the UN's Technology Access Partnership so that the global community could exit this crisis together on fair and equitable terms. For this is the promise of the multilateral institutions upon their formation to the people of the world, and it is the promise of democracies at the time of the settlement of independence to our people. Surely, we all know that our markets will recover, and undoubtedly, market competition will return. But for now, it is time to heal. And as we heal, it is time to reflect on the values and principles that led to the modern settlement of the global community in which we function and to recognize that the challenges that are literally undermining that settlement must be fought on head on 
and that the only way we can fight it head on is by those of us who constitute the majority, even if not the power of the few who are at the top, to come together and to assert that transparency, fairness, market access, and accountability must matter and must be attained for the people of the world. I thank you and I wish you all the very best in your deliberations. Prime Minister Motley, many thanks indeed for that statement of, of support for this for this initiative. Um, fairness and equitable access is clearly uh, the key buzzwords as we continue through this, this discussion. Um, I'm going to move now to speak to Axel Jakobsen, who is the State Secretary in the uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry in Norway. Um, Mr. Jakobsen, I believe you are on the line, and if you are, then make sure you're unmuted and, and please go ahead with your statement. Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear, yes. The wonders of technology. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. President Alvarado, Director General Dr. Tedros, colleagues, I'm honored on behalf of my country, Norway, to co-sponsor the Solidarity Call to Action, to establish a platform for open, collaborative sharing of knowledge, data, and intellectual property on existing and new health tools to combat COVID-19. As I speak, the official counts have passed 360,000 deaths globally from COVID-19, and the true figure is likely to be substantially higher. The pandemic represents a tragedy for its victims and their families, and economic hardships for hundreds of millions around the globe. If there's one thing this pandemic has reminded us, it is that challenges that are global can only be faced efficiently if we act together in a coordinated and global manner. It has also reminded us how vulnerable we are when we are confronted with a new virus without efficient tools to fight it. It is now of paramount importance that the world's best researchers and developers join forces in an unprecedented manner to provide us with these tools. Again, global challenges needs global solutions. I'm convinced that the only way to succeed is to collaborate and share knowledge and technologies to have the necessary tools as soon as possible. Once we have effective medicines and vaccines, they should be distributed in a fair and equitable way, according to public health criteria. This is the only way to curb the acute pandemic in the most efficient manner. The World Health Organization plays a vital role in facilitating the necessary sharing of knowledge. Rest assured that Norway stands firmly behind you in these efforts. Thank you again, President Alvarado, for raising this issue and for bringing us together today. Thank you very much. Axel Jakobsen, thank you very much indeed. We are now going to move on uh, and speak to Her Excellency Ambassador Monique van Dalen um, from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, the ambassador is the representative of the Netherlands to the United Nations in Geneva. I believe you are on the line. I think I saw you earlier. Uh, so, Ambassador, you have the floor. Yes, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Madam Prime Minister, Director General. The Netherlands supports the need for international cooperation and solidarity in combating COVID-19. The sharing of knowledge, intellectual property and data can play an important role in the development of vaccines or treatments that are affordable and accessible to all people in the world. This is especially true for knowledge that is created with public funding. The sharing must, in order to be effective, have a voluntary basis. We acknowledge that we need industry as a valuable partner. Their capacity to innovate, their expertise in development, production and distribution of vaccines and treatments, and their willingness to take risks must be valued alongside international cooperation, public investments and the sharing of knowledge. The main goal that we all want to achieve is a vaccine or treatment that is affordable and accessible to us all. In an innovation model based on the pooling of knowledge is, next to possible alternative models, a valuable instrument to pursue this aim. We thank Costa Rica and the WHO for their leadership 
and look forward to continuing to work together in fighting this public health crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. We now move to uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Maria Ferrani, who is the permanent representative of Brazil to the United Nations in Geneva. Ambassador Ferrani, uh, if you can hear me clearly, then please do unmute yourself and you have the floor. Okay. Director General, President Carlos Alvarado of Costa Rica, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm not sure you listen to me. Are you listening to me? Yes? Okay, so I'll start again. You have to listen again. Director General, President Carlos Alvarado of Costa Rica, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Brazil is honored to support this solidarity call to action and to participate in this launch event. We thank President Alvarado for his pioneering proposal and relentless work to bring all relevant partners together at this point. Access to quality, safe, efficient and affordable health technology remains a top priority for Brazil, all the more so in the context of this pandemic. Access to affordable medicines is key to build and strengthen sustainable and resilient health systems to achieve universal health coverage and to respond to health emergencies. In the case of COVID-19, Universal and equitable access to life-saving technologies is the only way to ensure that everyone, everywhere, will be safe and able to return to normalcy. Brazil is gratified to see that the global strategy and plan of action on public health, innovation, and intellectual property is one of the references for the call to action. Together with many partners, Brazil has led efforts to have this global strategy fully implemented to the benefit of all. We are confident that the call to action will be a major achievement in the public health worldwide, helping us all to rise up to the challenge posed by COVID-19. Thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you very much indeed. We now take you over to uh, Portugal. Dr. Rui Ivo is the president of the National Medicines Authority in Portugal and joins us live as well. Uh, Dr. Ivo, you have the floor. Hello. You can hear me. We can hear you very clearly. Yes, go ahead, please, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, president Carlos Alvarado of Costa Rica, Excellency, the Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, distinguished participants from uh, other states and institutions, representatives from academia, international partners, industry, civil society. It is with great pleasure that I send you warm greetings from Portugal and that our voice to the call to action proposed by Costa Rica and supported by the World Health Organization. A call that aims at ensuring equitable access to health technologies through sharing of knowledge and data indispensable to the diagnosis, prevention, treatment, and response to the pandemic outbreak of COVID-19. This initiative calls for a global priority in equitable access to health products and refers us to the importance of ensuring the principles of sustainability, availability, and accessibility of safe, effective, and quality health products. Uh, which more than ever are fundamental to tackling the current uh, pandemic. It also stresses the need to guarantee the production, supply chain and equitable distribution of essential health products to our fellow citizens. Finally, considering the potentially devastating economic and social repercussions to, for health, particularly for developing countries, this section also calls for effective international cooperation in order to strengthen our health systems for this and future pandemics. Knowing that we all share these values, uh, Portugal joins this call to action and its commitment to the collective success 
in combating COVID-19. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Ivo, thank you very much. Um, we do now have a representative from South Africa. Now we have the Health Minister, the Honourable Minister, Dr. Zwellini Mkizi, who is on the line for us. Uh, Dr. Mkizi, uh, please, your supporting statement for this initiative. Thank you very much, Excellencies. From South Africa, on behalf of President Ramaphosa, I take this opportunity to congratulate the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros, and the President of the Republic of Costa Rica, His Excellency, Mr. Carlos Alvaro Quesada, for launching this important initiative. We also appreciate the cross-regional efforts to realize equitable global access to COVID-19 health technologies as a critical response measure, as now more than ever, the world needs this solidarity and cooperation to pool knowledge, intellectual property, and data for existing and new diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, and for the detection, prevention, and treatment of COVID-19. The solidarity call to action calls on key stakeholders and the global community to commit to undertaking actions which are urgently needed to advance the sharing of knowledge, intellectual property, and data that will benefit all humanity. It is also an important complement to the ACT Accelerator, which was launched a few weeks ago, which aims at making diagnostics therapeutics and vaccines for COVID-19 accessible on the basis of need worldwide. We'd also like to emphasize the importance of governments and international partners uniting around a global guarantee that ensures that when a safe and effective vaccine is developed, it is produced rapidly at scale and may made available to all the people in all countries free of charge. We therefore call upon member states and the international community to support the solidarity call to action to promote health and to ensure the achievement of universal health coverage globally. Thank you very much. Honourable Minister, many thanks indeed. Um, as uh, those who have been watching uh, so far with this launch, the launch of this initiative, you will have noticed, and we've just had a series of supporting statements. Uh, and now we're going to move on to the next part, uh, which is the moderated discussion. And um, so we have a whole array of panellists who are going to be joining us. They're experts, they're industry experts, civil society representatives, uh, members from academia as well. Um, so it, first of all, I would like to um, welcome to the discussion Professor Mariano Matsuka, who is a professor in economics of innovation and public value at the University College London. Uh, professor, I, I believe you're on the, on the line and I'm just hoping that your video is on and your audio as well. Um, and my first question to you really is we're talking about a pool of technology. Why do we need this patent pool right now in the middle of this pandemic? Why is it necessary? There we go, good. It said that the host wouldn't unmute me. Well, it's it's absolutely necessary because there's no other choice. I mean, really, from the policy perspective, because this is, in fact, a policy uh, proposal, we need to frame it as actively shaping and creating this market in the way that needs to be governed to satisfy the mission, which is a vaccine that is globally accessible for free around the world. And that really means making sure that we govern the process from the intellectual property, which of course this common pool is focusing on, the pricing, the manufacturing capability, the international collaboration and solidarity instead of competition between countries. But to do that, it really means also thinking through what does it mean when countries globally have been putting in billions really into the health innovation market, and then unfortunately, Unlike the military, when they spend uh, you know, money on areas that they need, they then govern the process to make sure they win the war. Even though I don't like the war narrative, it does actually mean governing this process in such a way that the pricing, the IPR, the licensing, um, and you know, is done in such a way to really foster what the 21st century is about, which is collective intelligence. Okay, um, well, Mariana, that's really interesting. And I want to bring in a fellow economist now. Uh, professor Joseph Stieglitz is a professor at Columbia University. And um, Professor, I'm wondering whether you agree with that, whether you think this, this, this type of technology access pool is, is necessary for the distribution of, of health technologies when, uh, whenever we come up with them. Absolutely. Uh, you know, intellectual property is a social construction that is designed to promote uh, innovation.
But in this particular case, uh, the government is taking the the key role in in financing the research, uh, and having those ideas, the most important input into any research is other ideas, and that's why this pool of ideas is going is absolutely essential if there's going to be the fastest innovation possible. And speed is extraordinarily important in dealing with this pandemic. The longer it lasts, the more people die, but the worse the devastation for the economy. So it's actually important in this case, especially that there be this kind of patent pool, that this knowledge be used quickly for the benefit of everybody in our uh, global community. Let, I'm going to try and connect now with uh, Dr. Jacques Dubochet. Uh, I'm hoping that he's on the line uh, as well. Um, Dr. Jacques Dubochet is a Swiss scientist. He's also a Nobel laureate. Ah, sir, I can see you. Wonderful. Um, I, I know that you've advocated for, for open science. I'm wondering if you can just explain to all of us what exactly you mean by that and the role that you think that, sh that science should play going forward with this initiative. Oui, vous voyez le... Le COVID-19 est un intéressant exemple d'un mal commun. Il, nous, il est méchant avec nous tous, c'est tant qu'il existera quelque part dans le monde un malade. Ce malade est à nous tous et l'épidémie peut revenir, elle est avec nous tant qu'il y, qu y a des malades. Euh, c'est un mal commun. Mais à tout mal commun, on peut faire correspondre un bien commun. Et ce bien commun, c'est cette connaissance que tout le monde est en train d'acquérir et qui, peut-être, un jour, bientôt, va nous aider à soigner, à guérir un bien commun. Faisons ce bien commun. Et c'est justement l'idée de cette initiative que de la porter et que tout le monde travaille à cela. Mais il y a plus, parce que c'est un exercice formidable, un exercice visible, on en a besoin, et il nous prépare à un autre mal commun que nous avons besoin de traiter comme bien commun. C'est bien, c'est le problème du climat et le problème de la vie qui se dégrade dans l'ensemble de notre planète, Le virus, nous en sortirons et nous sommes au travail maintenant. Bravo, grâce à cette initiative. La planète, c'est la suivante. Et c'est pas la plus petite. Bonne chance à nous tous. Uh, Dr. Dubochet, many thanks. Uh, we are going to move on now and hopefully speak to uh, Philippe Duneton, who is the uh, Ad Interim Executive Director at Unitaid. Um, uh, Mr. Duneton, if you can hear me, I hope you can. Um, Unitaid is a, is a huge WHO partner and very much involved in, in, in this particular initiative. Can you just describe for those watching in the media, the public as well, what exactly Unitaid's role will be with rolling out this, this type of, uh, of, of pool? Hello, uh, good afternoon and good morning for everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me. So um, it's quite important as an initiative in Call for Action. UNITED is fully involved in the development of therapeutic and diagnostic under the ACT uh, Call for Action. And uh, we are working closely with partners, but also with WHO, of course. And um, finding the right medicines, the right diagnostic and the right vaccine is not sufficient. As it was said, it's quite important to make sure that it can be affordable everywhere. At a, at a low price. Um, as UNITED, we have a, a lot of experience in making the connection between the innovation and, uh, of course, the, the, the scale-up. Uh, and we have created 10, 10 years ago now uh, the medicine patent pool that uh, is coping with, the, the, of course, the industry to make affordable uh, medicine for HIV and, of course, hepatitis C. It is a great success because now, as I speak, um, we have a dozen of a million of people who can benefit from the, the latest innovation to fight HIV. 
And I think that this initiative today is very important also to make sure that we will have equitable access for the new vaccine, for the, for, for the, the, the treatment that we need to fight COVID-19. Thank you. Let's bring in uh, Greg Alton. Greg is a, a former uh, Chief Patents Officer for, for, for Gilead. Greg, if you can hear me, and I hope you can, um, we've been, we're obviously talking about, about patents now and intellectual property. I'm, I'm wondering, and I'm sure many other people watching this will be wondering as well, with all good intentions aside, what will it take to get companies on board to, to share their intellectual property and, and their knowledge? Great, I think I'm, I think I'm on mute, is that? Yes, you are, yeah. Okay, great, so um, first of all, let me just, just hold on, I got something weird on my screen here. Um, let me just start with, you know, I think that, and Dr. Tedros said this initially, I'm a big supporter of intellectual property and the role that the industry's played in bringing medicine forward. Um, however, with, with some, some, some things I think that, well, well, the reason I'm very supportive of this um, call to action. First of all, in terms of fair and equitable access, I do think it would be fantastic to see the industry come forward and commit to working with the medicines patent pool or other mechanisms to make the intellectual property that comes out of the products that we develop, whether they're vaccines, therapeutics, or diagnostics, to be produced by generic manufacturers and then made available in fair and um, equitable terms globally. Um, I do think to make this happen, you, we have to expect and respect that different companies will have different um, uh, uh, concerns that they're going to have that have to be addressed around whether, you know, if, if this is truly voluntary geographies around different uh, tierings of geographies, you know, understanding that the poorest countries of the world, what's fair and equitable for them will differ from middle income countries that will differ from wealthy countries. That's the way the industry is going to look at this. Um, I think they're going to look at protection around their commercial interests, their indications, their uses. But I do think this can be done. We've seen this done. In, we did an HIV, we've done this in, hep in hepatitis. I do think it's a good model, and I think I, I would love to see the industry come forward today while, while these products are being developed and make a commitment to make these products available for generic production, for local production, and get, get to what those terms are that will be acceptable. And it's going to vary from country to country. The other thing I just want to touch on why I'm very excited about this call to action is we don't have these products yet. We do not have the therapeutics. We do not have the vaccines. We do not have the diagnostics we need. I do also believe that the component of pooling knowledge, pooling data, creating a forum where this data can be shared to create those new breakthrough products is more important today given this epidemic than we've ever seen before, the human and economic cost. Is, we cannot wait for the typical development timeline of a vaccine or a therapeutic. And I think this is an opportunity to see if this pooling of knowledge, sharing of information, sharing of intellectual property, of breaking down these barriers can expedite that, that, that development and allow these breakthroughs to come through. And if this works in COVID-19 or in, in this particular epidemic, maybe then this model could be used for some of the neglected diseases around the world that the current IP and industry model doesn't work well for. Greg, thank you. I wonder if I can just bring back um, Professor Joseph Stieglitz uh, to, to, to comment on that, really. I'm wondering whether, Professor, you think that, that we can perhaps use this concept of a patent pool as, as an opportunity to prepare for future crises as well? Well, very much, very much so. And uh, what I want to emphasize are a couple points. One, the production of knowledge, as I said before, the most important ingredient is other knowledge. And when speed is important, as it is in this pandemic, you want that knowledge to be shared very quickly. What's interesting is that talking to my friends who are in the research community, that is happening at the individual level. But the question is, will the corporate level, will the institutional level buy into this? And what I find so exciting is the, the, the commitments being made all over the world in support of this. There's a second aspect that I want to highlight, which is we're going to need billions of doses of the drug, whatever medicines are going to be produced. That means it's really important to scale up at a low price. And the point, as long as this disease is going on in any part of the world, we're all going to be vulnerable. So it's really important in the interest of all of us that the prices be low. 
And that's not going to be achieved through monopoly pricing of the drug companies. It's only going to be true if we make sure that there's access to generics, to local producers, uh, the, the widest dispersion of production. Now, there has to be return to those who are making the, uh, their research, although much of the money is coming from the government. We should be clear about that. It's been de-risked. Uh, but we can do that through royalties, through charging for appropriate prices. That can be done within the within the, the patent pool. But what is really important here is the prioritization of speed and price accessibility. And that's really the idea behind this initiative, which I really commend you for. And Mariana Mazzucato, I believe you want to come in on this. Yes, I mean, I really think this is going to be the moment to make sure that we walk the talk of what kind of public-private collaborations should be in a space like this. And um, I don't think hepatitis C is a good example, uh, with all due respect, uh, Mr. Alton. This is actually the area where so many have written about, you know, an area which received billions from, for example, the National Institutes of Health, 10 years of research, and then ultimately was marketed for $84,000 for a 12-week course, one pill a day. Now, that whole issue of how can we actually produce, again, as I was saying before, along the whole value chain, so governing the patent system, as we're talking about today, but also the pricing system that really reflects that collective effort that we're making in so many different parts of the health industry, this is a problem that goes beyond vaccines. What, why this initiative is so important is we cannot risk getting it wrong. We have to today use this almost as a sandbox that hopefully will also create lessons for other parts of the sector. Um, and in terms of what Joseph Stiglitz was saying, you know, of course patents are important. They have simply been massively abused. They are too upstream. We today are patenting the tools for research. They're way too strong, hard to license. They're too wide. They're used for strategic reasons. So again, using this moment to also think much more broadly, how can we make patents do what they were meant to do in the beginning instead of really just fueling a lot of rents and monopoly power? Mariana, thank you. Uh, um, Charles Gore is the executive director of the Medicines Patent Pool, which uh, Dr. Tedros mentioned at the beginning of this of this uh, launch. And Charles Gore, if you can hear me clearly, um, based based on your experience at MPP, when you you have a, a, a patent pool already, can this scale and level of cooperation work? Does does it work in in practice? Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Hannah. Um, and just before I answer your question, I'd, I'd like to thank um, WHO and the Director General, um, Costa Rica and President Alvarado for inviting us to be part of this initiative. Um, perhaps I should just uh, talk a little bit about our history to answer your question. So we were set up by UNITAID in 2010 as a public health organization. Um, to uh, do voluntary licensing um, to enable access to HIV medicines um, and also to uh, facilitate the development of new treatments in the form of, for example, pediatric combinations, uh, single pill combinations, but also to make sure that, first of all, access was as quick uh, as possible and also as equitable as possible as Dr. Tedros said, to make sure that no one was left behind. And the success of that model uh, led to the global community asking us to expand our mandate, firstly to HIV, uh, hepatitis C and TB, and then more recently to uh, anything, any patented medicine on the WHO um, essential medicines list. And the model involves, uh, first of all, uh, working with experts and the affected communities and civil society to identify the needs, then working with the pharmaceutical industry to actually get the licenses, which we can then sub-license to many generic manufacturers that allow both scale up uh, to meet large uh, demands but also competition between the generic manufacturers to drive the price down. And then finally, with also governments and the affected communities to let them know what is available to make sure that 
they do access these affordable but high quality drugs as quickly as possible. Uh, and finally, to manage uh, this whole process. Um, I think you can see from the fact that, as uh, Philip Dunton mentioned, there's been, we've had a huge impact. Um, I'd just like to mention that um, our generic manufacturers have now delivered uh, 12 billion doses in the last 10 years. And based on that, our board at the beginning of the COVID um, crisis decided that we should offer that expertise and experience to the global community if it would be useful and consequently expanded our mandate to um, include anything that could be useful for COVID-19. And so we're now in this position of being very willing to offer that expertise and experience um, in the form of a, a, a pool to try and make sure that, that actually uh, initiatives like this really deliver. So we hope that we um, will have a, an important role in the operationalization of uh, this important initiative. And we would like to think that we will be able to have the kind of impact we've had in HIV in COVID-19 as well. Thank you. Charles Gore, thank you very much. Interesting to see that, you know, what you were saying about how the open licensing model does work and has been working already. And we've been hearing from experts and from the field of academia. Let's bring in civil society now. I wanted to speak to uh, Achal Prabala, who is from uh, the coordinator, rather, of um, Access Ibsa project uh, in India. Achal, I hope you can hear me and I hope we can see you. Um, uh, tell us then, what is the role of civil society in this, in this pool initiative? Oh, I think we may have dropped off. Apologies. Okay, let's move on then. Um, uh, Joshua Setipa is from the uh, UN Technology Bank. He is the managing director. I hope that uh, Joshua, you're on this on the call then. Um, I'm wondering how how can we ensure then that that medicines are as and when they become available that they are then available on an equitable basis across the world. Question there for Joshua Setipa of the UN Technology Bank. No, I, th I think, okay, we will move on. Um, Anna Marriott, I believe we do have Anna Marriott. Anna Marriott is the uh, health policy manager for, for, for Oxfam. Um, Anna, there's been quite a lot of talk already about HIV and AIDS and the response to the crisis uh, then. I'm wondering how conditions today compare with conditions then and, and um, whether we are better equipped today to deal with this pandemic. Oh, you're, and if you just need to unmute yourself, please. There we go. Oh, no, no, still can't hear you. Uh, no, still can't quite hear you. Let me just see if, uh, if we can get you just to unmute your microphone. If not, then I, perhaps I can turn back to one of our uh, esteemed economists who've been joining us already. Uh, perhaps, uh, Mariano, I know you're still on the call. I can see you nodding away there if you wanted to unmute yourself. Um, your thoughts on what we've been hearing then about using previous models or pre-existing models in order to, 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 to move further with a response to COVID-19. And I, again, if you could unmute yourself. We can't. Okay, here we go. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. I think the reason the others are having a problem um, on our screen, it says the host has muted us. So when we try to unmute, it doesn't oh. work. So whoever the host is, if you can ask them. To <laughs> I, I will. I hold my hands up and say, I'm not, I'm not the host. <laughs> sure. So, you know, this is a huge issue. Just one thing that I think is, is really important is that currently this is only voluntary. What I have been arguing actually for some time is that this could actually become more um, mandatory. You know, the reason, just as an example, because this shouldn't be pie in the sky, the reason we had, at least in the U.S., one of the most innovative private R&D departments in uh, AT&T, it later became Bell Labs, a very famous research and development department, was that there was conditions attached to the public subsidy that AT&T was getting to make sure that they actually reinvested their profits 
back into innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms. The history of conditionality sector by sector does exist. And this is strangely one where for some reason we haven't made conditions on the governance of areas like patents to be present when you have this very high amount of public investment that both Joseph Stiglitz and I have been talking about. Again, 40 billion a year just in the US, but actually if you look globally, there's trillions of pounds, euros, uh, you know, different currencies being put into health innovation and making sure that that public investment is also conditional on a governance of the system to actually meet a public interest test. I think you know, this could actually become the moment to do that because as long as it's just voluntary, and you know every country negotiates it uh, depending on bilateral relationships it doesn't get us what we're actually talking about here COVID has woken us up that you know global health only makes sense when it's global we are all only as safe as our neighbor is in our city in our nation and then globally had this epidemic begun um begun in africa where health systems are actually much weaker than in china we would globally be worse off so governing this system in such a way that has strong public interest metrics, I think, is the big innovation that we all need right now. Yeah. Uh, Anna Marriott, we, we could see you before. We couldn't quite hear you, but I believe your sound um, has been restored for us. Um, I was asking you about the, the, the comparisons we can make today between what happened with HIV and AIDS and the response or the, 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 the climate, the conditions that we are, we're operating in today. So I think many of those conditions of inequality and access are still very real today. Um, the very big difference that we're facing now is that this is a global crisis um, where everybody on the planet needs access to these technologies. That we've heard about global public goods realize those in practical terms but this is only going to work if every government steps up to the table and makes those commitments and we're very very welcome of the governments that have taken leadership today but we need all governments to come to the table along with pharmaceutical companies and I'm, I will say that some of the reactions from some pharmaceutical um, players today about this initiative is disappointing. We really need them to properly engage with the details of this call, step up to the table. But alongside that, I just want to set, you know, reassert this point that we are seeing millions of taxpayers' money being invested in this, in this, um, uh, in the research and development for the medical solutions for this. We do need to see those conditions attached that will force um, the pooling force the sharing of these solutions to this pandemic. The, the scale of the crisis is too big, it's too vast to leave it to the voluntary um, and philanthropic efforts of pharmaceutical companies. Anna, thank you. Um, Achal Prabhala, we were hoping to speak to you earlier, and I believe you're back with us again now. Um, I was asking you about civil society and the, the role that civil society can have, not just uh, in, the, in this particular um, technology access pool, but also just in response to COVID-19 in general. Yeah, well, look, uh, civil society has a, a limited role to play here. Civil society can put pressure on national governments and national governments, especially those governments which have the capacity to, to manufacture tests and treatments and vaccines, who also have the political will to do what they need to do with intellectual property monopolies, can, can make some efforts to uh, do their bit to contain the pandemic. But the truth is that we need the COVID-19 technology pool to succeed because it's really the best shot that the world has. Uh, the, most countries in the world don't have the capacity to be able to manufacture what they need, even without the presence of monopolies that will thwart their ability to do so. But in saying so, we need to have a couple of things in place. The first is participation. We need to have the participation of rich countries and along with that participation, we need to have uh, the leverage that rich countries have in terms of their investment and buying of medical technologies that they can then contribute to the pool. But we also need to look at the scope of the pool. In the past, a lot of access licenses have, uh, have, been, sa have been satisfied to stop at poor countries, at getting access to poor countries. 
I think what we need to look at here is getting access to poor people wherever they live, whether they live in poor countries, whether they live in what are called middle income countries, or indeed whether they live in rich countries. I think if we go by the access models of the past, they've failed primarily because they have failed to reach the vast numbers of poor people in a highly unequal country like Brazil, for instance, simply because it's classified as middle income as a middle income country, and it's assumed, therefore, that uh, they have better access to buying drugs on the market or vaccines on the market, where in fact they don't. Achal Prabhula, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can now speak to the Managing Director of the UN Technology Bank, Joshua Setipa. Um, Joshua, if you can hear me, I'm just going to crack on with my question and hope that, 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 that it's all clear with the connection. Um, I'm wondering then, how can we um, ensure that medicines, once they are available, vaccines, etc., are available on an equitable, ba uh, equitable basis uh, you know, uh, across the world? Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. We, as a technology bank, we are an implementing partner of the Health Technology Access Pool and are working very well uh, with, the, with the WHO, with the UNDP, and also with UNCTAD in launching the Technology Access Partnership, which seeks to address some of these challenges that we've had uh, so well articulated today. One of the realities is that uh, Having the, the, the technology available is one step, but where the challenge remains is how do you then transfer or transform that technology into actual capacity to produce and be able to meet the demand that we see uh, that uh, countries are facing today. And what we are doing uh, we, we, as a technology access partnership is to create a platform that connects technology holders with technology seekers and provide also support to be able to transform that technology uh, that is available into actual capacity to produce. We are also uh, working with, uh, to, 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 to ensure that there is also capacity that will not only allow countries to meet their current COVID-19 uh, uh, challenges, but also be able to be part of their post-recovery effort. And one of, the, one of the key areas of support that uh, we are providing to developing countries uh, is to also serve as a repository for these technologies, for data and for knowledge, and also to provide legal and policy support, which we know is very important uh, for, for technology-seeking entities and also to, to facilitate these partnerships, which are very key. Uh, as we've heard from, from our colleagues from, the, from civil society, this is an effort that requires all stakeholders on board. Otherwise, then there will always be gaps, and we know where there are gaps. The poor countries or the least developed countries are the ones that fall behind. Thank you very much. Joshua Setipa, thank you very much. Um, we've had um, lots of questions coming in from members of the public who are watching this, um, and so I, I, I would like to just sort of throw some of those questions, or at least one of them, when I can find them on my screen, <laughs> uh, back to our panelists as well. Um, so uh, perhaps to um, Dr. Jacques Dubochet, um, one question that we've had in is what learning can we draw from knowledge pooling during the AIDS pandemic? And of course, this is something that we've been talking about a lot, but what learning can we draw from the, from knowledge pooling during the HIV AIDS pandemic? That question to, let's go to um, Dr. Dubochet. I'm not a specialist of that. There are people, I don't know, we, there are people who are much better for that, but nevertheless, um, well, the, the COVID is, uh, Sorry, active leçon. No, okay? we can hear you. We can hear you clearly, sir. Yeah. Oh yes. Well, that, that I was saying before that the, this COVID is a, a, an exercise for the planet of what so. But also uh, in Stockholm, when I gave my my speech for my Nobel Prize, I was asking that anything about medicine, about health belongs is a common good for all the world. We have the problem, the case of COVID, and the COVID will be an excellent exercise for considering anything about medicine, about health as a common good of, for humanity. Woo! Good work. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Dubosche. Um, another question. Uh, let me just bring up my screen so I can clear uh, so I can see clearly. Um, let's put this question then uh, to Professor Stieglitz. Um, what guarantee can you give, or can the panel give in general, that this initiative will benefit everyone on the planet? This is, of course, what we're talking about in general, is how to make sure that this is delivered and distributed on an equitable basis. But what guarantee can the panelists here give that, that this initiative will, will do just that? Well, I think what we can say is that it's going to be more equal than it otherwise would be. Uh, I don't think we can ever, in our very unequal society, expect anything to be fully equal. But what we know is that if we leave it to the usual mechanisms of monopoly pharmaceutical companies who are driving up the prices, uh, it will mean that those who are poorer, whether they're in the rich countries, the middle-income countries, or the whole uh, of the poorer countries, they won't have access unless we have this kind of patent pool. So to me, uh, it's an absolutely essential uh, step in moving towards greater equality of access. And remember, unless uh, some, uh, many people have emphasized the fact, unless the whole world is protected, uh, none of us are protected. So it really requires a global effort to make sure that everybody gets access to uh, the vaccines, to the testing, to the retrovirals, to the therapeutic medicines. Uh, Philippe Duneton from uh, Unitaid, I hope you're still uh, with us. I, I can see you on the screen there. But uh, another question, this is coming from uh, viewers who are watching this, this broadcast. Um, who owns the data and how will it be governed? I'm, I don't know if this is a, an appropriate question for you, but I'm, I'm wondering if you if you'd care to, to offer an answer to that. Philippe Duneton. Sorry. Um, no, I think it's... Uh, we, we are focusing on the IP, and I think it's, it's correct because it's a, a barrier. But uh, uh, to make sure that, uh, in particular for certain type of product, you need to have uh, also a way to transfer the know-how, uh, transfer uh, the, 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 um, the quality insurance, um, and also to have mechanisms to make sure that you have a, a, the right price. So. Of course, that's the question, and we discussed with WHO, we discussed with the medicine patent pool, because we know very well how this uh, will work. Uh, but we need to uh, also build uh, a system that can uh, cope with that kind of uh, other type of uh, information that we need to increase the production. Just a point, because I think that we need to be clear. If we get a, a treatment and potentially a vaccine, um, uh, one company itself may not be in situation to have the, the capacity to address the volume. So it's something that we need to, to work on with the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, it's not uh, just a, an idea, it's a practical need that we need to cooperate and to find solution. That's why this framework and this initiative is quite, quite important. But we need also the support of industry to find a way to address that very specific question you, you have, uh, IP is important, and we have, with the medicine patent pool, a mechanism uh, that is up and running, but we need also to address other type of information to make sure that we can increase, really, the, the production capacity. And uh, Greg Alton, if you're still there on the line as well, which I believe, again, you are, um, another question that's come to us from people watching uh, is that the pat a patent pool sounds like the most viable way forward, but what are the enablers and barriers to implementing this? Greg, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I just was trying to turn my, my, my mute off. So the, the, the mechanism is there already. So we, we've already, and, and Charles talked about this, we've already seen success with the, with the patent pool for access to medicine for, for products that already have been developed in HIV, now in viral hepatitis, and, and, and it's expanding into other areas. And with this patent pool, it's, it's done on an individual company level. A company would, would go to the medicines patent pool, negotiate, um, the scope of the license, so the countries that would be covered, that would have access to the generic medicines that we produced, there'd be quality and other, other conditions put on it, but it actually has worked quite well. Um, to, to, but now to, to comment on some other speakers that have talked before, 
the the the, the bigger challenge is countries that are not within the medicines patent pool or were not covered by the by the scope of the license um in, you know in the countries in between and then the wealthy countries and it's going to be middle income countries it's going to be poor people in, in even in wealthy countries that aren't covered and, and so i think what what what's missing is how we address those populations and i think we need to have a, a really rational conversation about what the equipments at the country level is of take a middle income country to provide access to poor people in a, a wealthy country to provide access to poor people and what are reasonable fair equitable terms from the industry would be to address that um, but the mechanism exists right now what does not exist today is the sharing the pooling of knowledge Oh, Greg, we lost you just at the end then, but I think I think you've wrapped up. <laughs> um, my thanks to all the participants. Uh, we've reached that part in the uh, in this session in this uh, very exciting launch um, that when we're going to hear from some heads of state, um, heads of state who haven't unfortunately been able to join us live, but they have spent the time to um, send us more supporting statements and video messages as well. And we know that this is a, a global effort, a global collective effort. Um, and as we've been hearing from all the participants so far, you know, global challenges need global solutions. And I'm so thrilled that we have a, a number of um, hugely supportive statements from uh, Excellencies, heads of state from across the world. Um, so we will begin uh, with His Excellency Lenin Moreno, the president uh, of Ecuador. And then, as I say, we will go through several others afterwards. Um, if we have time at the end, I will uh, try to get to some more questions from those of you who are sending them in. Um, if not, we will, of course, make sure that WHO is, is collating them and we'll get back to you as well, um, perhaps with some direct messages from, from the experts um, from across the board who've been involved in the discussion today. Um, please do all stay on, stay on the line, uh, all those who have been involved so far in the discussion. Um, and we'll go through some of these videos now uh, from our um, uh, distinguished presidents and the like uh, from around the globe. So first of all, let's hear from the president of Ecuador. This is His Excellency Lenin Moreno. Friends, I'm pleased to declare Palau's support in the United Nations call to action, calling for solidarity in ensuring... Estimado amigo y presidente de Costa Rica, Carlos Alvarado. Señor Director General de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, Dr. Tedros Adhanom. Todos somos testigos del enemigo común que tiene en este momento la humanidad. Ningún país, ningún país tiene la capacidad de luchar de forma aislada. Y creo que ya nos hemos dado cuenta de ello. Las crisis globales, como la pandemia del COVID-19, exigen de poner completamente intereses particulares exigen que todos los miembros de la comunidad internacional actuemos de manera conjunta, de manera solidaria, unida, a través de foros multilaterales como precisamente este, este de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, bajo la premisa de que la salud constituye un bien público global. Coincidimos en que la lucha contra esta pandemia exige que no reinventemos nosotros mismos, reinventemos la forma en que debe operar la cooperación internacional, que renovemos los recursos de investigación para desarrollar soluciones científicas que garanticen la salud de toda la población sin exclusión alguna. Debemos actuar de manera urgente, conjunta, para contener y contrarrestar la COVID-19. Tenemos que derribar las barreras políticas y técnicas que impiden el acceso al conocimiento y tenemos que implementar sistemas accesibles, abiertos y transparentes de propiedad intelectual porque es deber de los estados garantizar un derecho humano esencial, que es la salud de la población. Al llamado que realiza la Organización Mundial de la Salud, deberán sumarse múltiples actores, tales como los organismos financieros internacionales, las organizaciones humanitarias, los organismos no gubernamentales también deben estar ahí, las entidades filantrópicas deben estar ahí, las empresas farmacéuticas privadas y los proveedores de tecnologías de la información y comunicación. Todos deben estar ahí. Hoy Ecuador hace un llamado a la comunidad internacional para acelerar la obtención de soluciones científicas, para que el desarrollo tecnológico científico ayude y el intercambio sea amplio y los beneficios de la prevención y respuesta al COVID-19 
estén en manos de todos. Los gobiernos cumplen un papel determinante al generar mecanismos que permitan que toda investigación sea disponible, sea accesible, a escala global. Ecuador considera que la pandemia es sin duda alguna una dificultad, un gran problema, pero a la vez constituye una gran oportunidad para renovar la vigencia del sistema multilateral, con respuestas articuladas, con respuestas integrales, basadas en los principios elementales para ello, de cooperación, de solidaridad, de equidad y con un enfoque de responsabilidades compartidas, devolver a la ciudadanía también la responsabilidad que le corresponde. En este marco, mi país suscribe hoy la acertada propuesta, llamando a la acción, una acción para acelerar los esfuerzos del desarrollo que se están haciendo de encontrar el tratamiento y la vacuna contra el COVID-19. Muchas gracias. I muted myself. Uh, totally my fault. Now, we had a taster just before hearing uh, from President Moreno of another president. Um, apologies for that mix-up. Um, but we will now, uh, our thanks, of course, to the President of Ecuador, uh, President Moreno. We will now hear from the President of Palau, uh, Thomas Isang Remengesau. Please, friends, I'm pleased to declare Palau's support in the United Nations call to action calling for solidarity in ensuring equitable global access to the health technologies being developed for the detection, prevention, control, and treatment of COVID-19. The Republic of Palau has been fortunate to be one of the few countries in the world with no confirmed cases of the coronavirus. This accomplishment has only been possible through the drastic but necessary measure of closing our borders to international travelers. Although we have successfully prevented the virus from arriving so far, we, like the many other island states that have taken the same drastic step, cannot keep our borders closed forever. Island states may seem isolated from the rest of the world, but we are also deeply embedded in the global economy and rely on individuals outside of our borders to enable our continued development. We are eager for the day when international travel is once again safely possible and when we can welcome everyone back to our pristine paradise. Making this future a reality is why this call to action is so important. Just as the virus does not discriminate based on passports, neither should its cure. Palau joins the countries around the world and the WHO in this call to action and affirms that the health technologies being developed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic should be available to everyone. We are already seeing deeply worrying statements that countries that research vaccines and manufacture treatments should be prioritized in access to those health technologies. But where does that leave the smallest of us who lack this research and manufacturing capabilities? We need instead to turn to global solidarity, especially in this 75th anniversary year of the founding of the United Nations. We need to live up to the vision of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, to leave no one behind. It is only through this global solidarity and ensuring equitable access to COVID-19 health technologies that we will overcome this pandemic. Thank you very much. Our thanks there to uh, the President of Palau, uh, Tommy Remengasau. And let's hear now from the President of Uruguay, His Excellency Luis Lacaepo. Estimado Presidente Alvarado, le cuento que ando en el norte del país, recorriendo por algún foco importante en, en la frontera con el Brasil. Y y siempre, y en este caso mucho más, adherir a la, a la propuesta, adherir a la cooperación internacional, adherir a los gobiernos, a los particulares, a los científicos, a los organismos internacionales para la cooperación multilateral. Es muy importante en, en la salida de esta pandemia, pero también hacia el futuro. Creo que todo esto nos deja 
una enseñanza, así que presidente, por supuesto, desde acá, con el afecto y con el respeto, adherir a esta convocatoria suya. Le mando un abrazo. Retno Masudi is uh, the minister, the honourable minister for foreign affairs in Indonesia, and sent us this video. Your Excellency, the Director General of WHO, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the President of the Republic of Indonesia, allow me to begin by conveying Indonesia appreciation for Costa Rica initiative on the call to action to ensure global access for medicine and equipment necessary in our fight against COVID-19. The call of action is very timely and addresses a paramount issue to guarantee equitable availability and accessibility of treatment and vaccine for this disease. In this regard, Indonesia support the call to action in the hope that a voluntary pooling of patent will significantly accelerate the production of COVID-19 medicine and vaccine to meet global demand, particularly for developing and least developed countries. This is the time for us to also rally behind the WHO to be the platform for cooperation among countries in matters concerning public health and to ensure that multilateralism delivers. Upon the discovery of the most effective treatment, medicine and vaccine for COVID-19, it is imperative that we ensure its availability and affordability for people everywhere. Just as COVID-19 does not discriminate between nationalities, race, religion, or economic status, so its remedy must also be accessible to everyone, regardless of their background. I thank you very much. Masudi, we thank you. Uh, the Honourable Abdullah Amin is, a minister, is the Minister of Health in the Maldives and sent us this video. Maldives. To all colleagues, friends and leaders from like-minded governments, to heads of WHO and other relevant multilateral institutions, to our partners belonging to the scientific, pharmaceutical and medical technology community, and to all and everyone who believes in global solidarity to safeguard human dignity and well-being. COVID-19 has taught us how interconnected and interdependent we are, how vulnerable and ill-prepared most countries are in the face of a public health pandemic, a pandemic that rages on for months, damaging not only our general health and exposing the weaknesses in our health systems, but draining our resources and crippling the global economy, which inevitably would have enduring socio-economic impacts across and within countries and communities. While no country has been spared from the effect of COVID-19, some countries are worse affected than others, and the challenges of overcoming this calamity is equally daunting to such nations. At this critical juncture, a historical moment in human history when humanity itself is at stake, the world has an historic opportunity to come together in global solidarity to overcome a global threat. Solidarity in ensuring that all persons have human dignity and are ensured basic human rights, including the right to health care on the basis of equity and equality. In respect of global principles and commitments, when a treatment or vaccine for COVID-19 is developed, some countries or communities should not be left behind or too far behind. We are all equal and belong to one world, one humanity. Maldives applauds this timely initiative by the President and Government of Costa Rica and supported by the WHO. As individual nations continue fighting the disease locally, the global battle against COVID-19 pandemic can only be won only by realizing equitable global access to COVID-19 health technologies through sharing of knowledge, intellectual property, and data. Therefore, I, on behalf of the Government of Maldives, wish to join other like-minded nations and endorse the solidarity call to action on COVID-19. I am sure with global solidarity and shared vision and shared resources, we would be able to overcome this calamity. With global solidarity and when all nations join hands, 
humanity will always triumph. Abdullah Amin, thank you very much. Uh, we move away now from uh, heads of state and honorable ministers, and we speak, or we hear from rather, Michel Bachelet, who is the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to join you all in launching this call to action on a very important issue for us, especially today, ensuring that everyone has equal access to medicines and health technologies to prevent, detect, and treat COVID-19. The arrival of this pandemic transformed the world and our way of living in the space of a few short weeks. The impact of both the outbreak and the measures adopted in response to it have highlighted stark societal inequalities and their impact on our opportunities in life, our ability to thrive, and all of our human rights, including health. Even before we were confronted with COVID-19, access to healthcare, medicines, and health technologies was uneven, with deprivation depending on whether one was poor, susceptible to discrimination, or living in other situations of uh, marginalization. The pandemic has only broadened these disparities, and we must act now to change this harmful dynamic that robs so many of our, their life and health. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we all recognize the imperative to build back better. And it is here that our partnership as actors in government, civil society, the United Nations system, the private sector and others has the opportunity to come into its own. Each of us holds one or several of the keys to unlocking access to medicines and health technologies for all. Some hold the keys to law and policy, others to research, development, and innovation, and still others to affordability. Our human rights values, among them the rights to life, health, and to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications, equality and non-discrimination can help us to navigate this configuration of collective responsibility. The benefits of scientific progress, especially as they apply to life-saving innovations, were always meant to be shared. At no time has it been more urgent to work towards this goal. If not rapidly brought under control, the COVID-19 pandemic will continue to devastate livelihoods, businesses, and economies, affecting all of us in some way. So let us join forces to exchange data and information, accelerate technology transfer, and expand the availability of medicines and health technologies. Let us all do our part and let us do it well. us there. Let's hear now from Jagan Chapagain, who is the Secretary General of the IFRC, the International Federation of the Red Cross. The International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies is fully committed to this call to action. We join the call to assure equitable global access to new COVID-19 essential health technologies, starting from the most vulnerable population in the most difficult and fragile context. Developing technologies, be it vaccines, drugs or diagnostics, is a first important step. Ensuring fair allocation across countries and timely delivery to all in need, especially the most vulnerable, will be the greatest challenge. The time to prioritize equity is now. Prioritizing equity means putting the most disadvantaged communities at the center of our collective response to COVID-19 pandemic. Fair and equitable allocation and distribution will require an effective and inclusive engagement of the communities in the entire life cycle of this mammoth process. Therefore, one of the key priorities should be the meaningful participation of the organizations with deep roots in the communities and the communities themselves at every stage to promote the acceleration of global scientific research into COVID-19 prevention, detection, treatment, and care. The IFRC, through its 192 member Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, with their network of 14 million volunteers, are providing life-saving services and essential assistance across the world. Community health workers, including Red Cross and Red Crescent volunteers, represent a sustainable, trusted, and critical resource in delivering healthcare services. Together with communities and health service providers, they join efforts for better health, prevent diseases, raise awareness, and reach out the most vulnerable 
and outreach populations with concrete actions. During the current pandemic, they are listening and responding to the needs of the most vulnerable groups, helping to mitigate the direct and in indirect health consequences of COVID-19, as well as its social and economic impact. As we gather today to call for fairness and equity, we offer our large community network of volunteers and our global presence in support of the call to action to continue protecting every single person from the dramatic impact of COVID-19 and ensure that we leave no one behind. The power of our common humanity is and will be measured by how we collectively protect the weakest among us. Thank you. Again, thank you very much. As Shannon Hader is the Deputy Executive Director of UNAIDS. I'm Shannon Hader, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director at UNAIDS. Humanity today, in its, all its fragility, is searching for an effective and safe vaccine against COVID-19. It's our best hope of putting a stop to the painful global pandemic. UNAIDS called on health ministers at the World Health Assembly last week to rally behind the idea of a people's vaccine. And we support the solidarity call to action to establish a global pool of products for health to prevent, diagnose, and treat COVID-19. The Solidarity Call promotes the sharing of knowledge of data and intellectual property on COVID-19 to drive the most rapid development and just distribution of all technologies designed to detect, prevent, and treat the virus. It ensures that those technologies can't be monopolized or hoarded or otherwise restricted from reaching the people who need them most. Just like healthcare, a coronavirus vaccine cannot be a privilege. It must be a right for all to be shared and a shared investment in our common safety and well-being. Thank you. Shannon Hader, thanks very much indeed. We're now going to hear from uh, Paul Fellner. Paul Fellner, President and CEO of Revision Therapeutics, and I'm grateful for the chance to support the solidarity call to action for a COVID-19 technology pool. In addition to public good and human rights, Information sharing accelerates progress and reduces cost, factors that should motivate investors to support the COVID-19 technology pool. The largest company and even the largest country can only create and know a fraction of available information. Accordingly, in an information sharing environment, each contribution of information yields multiples, not mere percentages, of information dividends. A study of 100 patients becomes a study of 10,000. A single regulatory dossier can benefit from the experience of 10 others, and the next one from 11. Manufacturing can quickly scale globally from one center. This amplification of benefit should be incentive enough, if not for researchers, for their funders who seek to maximize the value of every dollar of investment. Secrecy of data, regulatory dossiers, and manufacturing processes may confer a profitable competitive advantage to the owner of that information in usual circumstances. We're not in usual circumstances. The economic cost of COVID-19 far outweighs any individual benefit. The global economic consequences the world has already experienced from COVID-19 should convince everyone to prioritize speed, including information sharing. The COVID-19 Therapeutics Accelerator, a consortium of 15 multinational pharmaceutical companies and the Gates Foundation, offers compelling evidence that even commercial entities recognize that in collaboration speed. And we turn now to uh, Richard Wilder, who is the General Counsel and Director of Business Developments with CEPI. Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, the opportunity to speak on the solidarity call to action to realize equitable global access to COVID-19 technologies. CEPI is wholly committed to equitable access to the vaccines we fund, and the opening lines from the call to action resonate with us. The single most important priority of the global community is to stop the COVID-19 pandemic in its tracks, to halt its rapid transmission and reverse the trend of consequential global distress. We know that this goal is only achievable when everyone everywhere can access the health technologies they need for COVID-19 detection, prevention, treatment, and response. Again, this resonates strongly with CEPI and is in accordance with how we manage the COVID-19 vaccine projects we are funding. Speed, scale, and fair access are our central driving objectives. The call to action urges actors involved in this work to take specific action, 
To that end, let me tell you what CEPI is doing. First, we believe there is strength in numbers when it comes to the scientific process. The scientific community working on COVID-19 interventions can advance more rapidly if what we are learning is shared broadly, rapidly, and openly. In our agreements, we require our awardees to rapidly disseminate project results, such as assays and standards, animal models, or correlates of protection, share project data with the broader community, publicly disclose clinical trial data, and publish the results of the research under open access principles. Second, we ensure access to the vaccines that result from our funding through our funding agreements. Consistent with the call to action, our agreements specify that the vaccines produced must be affordable, available, and accessible to all that need them. These agreements specify how these obligations will be met, including, of course, any necessary intellectual property licensing arrangements. Third, we are a committed partner in the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. The vaccine pillar includes CEPI, Gavi, and the WHO as implementing partners. We're working with those partners to design a global allocation and procurement mechanism, which will deliver equitable access to the vaccine's CEPI funds. Our agreements explicitly enable the obligations on access to flow into those procurement and allocation mechanisms in the ACT Accelerator. We're glad to be able to join with so many dedicated organizations, researchers, and companies to meet the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic. Only by being inclusive, being open to finding solutions, and working together towards a common goal articulated in the call to action will we succeed. Thank you very much. Richard Wilder there. Uh, and finally, from the videos, uh, let's hear from Hanan Sboul, the chair of the International Generic and Biosimilar Medicines Association, otherwise known as IGBA. International Generic and Biosimilar Medicines Association, IGBA, invites generic and biosimilar medicines manufacturers to actively engage and commit to contributing to the global manufacturing capacity once an existing or newly discovered therapeutic is proven to be effective against COVID-19. As stipulated by this unique and time-limited new health technology pool, sharing of open relevant technologies, knowledge, IP and data on a voluntary basis will facilitate their use in research and development and will mobilize and expand additional manufacturing capacity since effective technology transfers and early access to key, to key technologies would be permitted. This should be complemented by a clear policy action by WHO member states to plan for future need in full transparency and cooperation with the pharmaceutical industry, both right holders and licensees where applicable. A framework will be provided allowing generic and biosimilar medicines manufacturers to actively contribute to the global manufacturing capacity by utilizing their know-how and expertise to produce and distribute generic and biosimilar versions of patented medicines at a global level. The licenses will also provide the freedom to develop new treatments such as fixed dose combinations and special formulations for children. Competition will also help to bring prices down and accelerate access to COVID-19 treatments and help to overcome this global pandemic. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned before, that is the end of all of the, uh, the videos. We've, of course, heard from so many um, heads of state and from uh, members of the public have been getting in contact, those of you who are watching uh, online at the moment. And thank you for that. Um, but um, my chance now really just to, to wrap up, this has, of course, been the launch of this landmark COVID-19 technology access pool, otherwise known as CTAP. Um, we've, as I've said, heard from heads of state. and uh, We've also heard... Uh, from so many um, representatives from the world of academia, from industry, civil society as well, international partners to WHO. And uh, my great thanks to, a uh, big thanks to all of you who, are, who have stayed uh, around on the call and who have answered so many of my questions and questions from the, the, the public and the media as well as we've gone through this, uh, this landmark launch. Um, I would also like to express huge thanks from WHO to its partner in this initiative, and that is, of course, uh, President Alvarado of Costa Rica. So, Your Excellency, I know you, you've been uh, also sticking around and listening to all the contributors on this call. Our huge thanks to you uh, and uh, thank you for coming up with this initiative and we wish you well with seeing it through as well. Um, it, that's just for me now to uh, say thank you to everyone for watching. Uh, I'm sure you can watch back this discussion uh, online as well on the various formats. Uh, and for now, 
Have a very good evening from London. Thank you.